So thanks for having this uh, nice introduction. I'm very happy to get to be here and to close off uh, this conference. Um, it also happens to be the last day of uh, my uh, working week because tomorrow I'm gonna go with maternity leave. So I'm happy that I get to do this on my last day, something real fun uh, because I love sharing uh, this work with you all. Because uh, I, I think it's a very exciting topic and it's really, uh, well, you can expect to hear a lot more about this. So I'm going to talk to you about quasi-normal modes and nonlinearities. So first off, what are quasi-normal modes? Like you probably have seen this picture, right? Uh, a typical gravitational wave from uh, a binary black hole merger, right? So in the beginning, we have the in spiral when the two black holes are still quite far away from each other. And we have the merger regime and the ring down. And these three different phases, right? They're, they're not very, yeah. You know, not very strict when one ends and the next one starts, but roughly speaking, uh, they get their division from the, the way we describe these phases, right? So we can describe the in spiral phase very well with post-Newtonian techniques, the merger, we really need numerical relativity. And for the ring down part, we can use uh, black hole perturbation theory. Now the ring down phase is interesting, right? Because what you see really is something special. If you see an a signal with an amplitude that is decaying, right? but the frequency is more or less constant. So this is exactly the regime that is interesting to me. And that's the regime also where right, the quasi-normal modes live. Right? The fact that the frequency is constant means also that these frequencies are interesting for us. Note that this is very different from the in-spiral, right? where the amplitude more or less stays constant, but the frequency is the thing that changes the most. Now these quasi-normal modes are very cool because they can be predicted um, using black hole perturbation theory, and they really reveal key properties of the black hole. Right? So they encode the information of the mass and the spin of the black hole. So, you know, just as an example, right? If I hit a bell, right, with say a hammer, I'll hit some or hear some notes. But you know, the same will happen. Say if I hit that bell with a beach ball or you know anything else, I'll hear roughly speaking similar tones, right? The same frequency. Of course, the amplitude will be quite different, right? Uh, I think if I hit it with a hammer, you'll hear uh, the tones much better than if I do that with a beach ball. But in principle, right, you you roughly hear the same frequencies because the frequencies are determined by the bell. Right? Of course. Right? So if I have a bigger bell, right, you hear lower tones. If I um, change the material of the bell, right, you'll hear different sounds. If I change the shape, right, I get different frequencies. All of these frequencies, right, are determined by the properties of the bell. The amplitudes are determined by how you hit it. And in a way, right, we can think of black holes as the simplest bells in our universe because the frequencies of these bells, right, are determined by all the properties of the bell, right? Like I said, like the material, its size, uh, its shape, but, you know, all properties of a black hole are determined by just its mass and spin, right? So black holes are the simplest bell that there exists and the, the, the quasi-normal modes that they emit are, purely describes, or, you know, if you know the mass and the spin of the black hole, you know what the frequencies are. So what is the mathematical description of this all, right? So if I have a typical, you know, waveform, right? I always have a plus and a cross polarization. I, if I do black hole perturbation theory, right? I can decompose it into a time radial part and some angular part, uh, or the angular part, right? There are the typical spin wave harmonics, not critical, but the, the time radial part right, has this interesting behavior, right? So if we analyze the signal far away from uh, the black hole merger, right, we see this dominant one over R dependence that we know, right? And with high order corrections, right? So of course, like there are one over R squared terms, et cetera. And then, as I said, right, this signal in the ring down can be very well described by damped sinusoids, right? So we have some amplitude and some exponential, where the amplitude and the 
as I said, right, are determined by the, de the details of the hammer. Right? So in this case of a black hole binary merger, right, you can think of the, you know, if I have an unequal mass binary, you can think of the smaller black hole as hitting the bigger black hole, right? And that determines the amplitude in this phase. And then the stars of the show, of course, are these frequencies. And these frequencies are purely determined by the mass and the spin of the final black hole, nothing else. Now note that these frequencies, they have some, have to be uh, complex, right? Because otherwise I wouldn't have a damped sinusoid, right? The damping comes from the uh, imaginary part. So the real part gives you the typical frequency and the imaginary part of the frequency is inversely related to the damping time. Note also that these frequencies, they depend on three integers, right? L, M, and N. These L and M, they just come directly from uh, the fact that I decomposed my signal into uh, uh, spherical harmonics, right? So that means that the L is just simply, you know, goes from, there's an integer that goes from two, three, four, et cetera. And M is always between minus L and L. And then we also have this N label. The N labels uh, your overtones, right? So just as I have a string, right? I can have the fundamental mode, which would just be you know, not cross um, the zero axis, so to say, or I could have an overtone, right? Which would cross the uh, zero axis once, or I have two crossings and I get the second overtone, et cetera. Now in a typical gravitational wave signal, right? We know that also during the in spiral, but the same holds for uh, um, the ring down phase, the 2 2 mode is dominant. Uh, and of course, then that also the fundamental one. So the 2 2 0 frequency would be the most dominant. And then you may have uh, higher order ones in your signal as well. Now, as I mentioned, right, these frequencies we can calculate very, very well just using black hole perturbation theory. So either we take Schwarzschild as a background and perturb it, do linear perturbation theory and get these frequencies out or more, slightly more complicated case, the Kerr space time as a background with perturbations and get these frequencies out. And, and all we need right, to do these frequencies or in the calculation are what the mass and the spin of the black hole are and we would get these numbers. Now, you may ask yourself the question, okay, you do this at linear order in perturbation theory. What if you were to go to the next order in perturbation theory? So you go to second order. How would things change? And that's an interesting question, right? Because going to second order, you already probe a little bit the nonlinearities of general relativity. Right? At linear order, by construction, you have linearized the theory. So you are getting rid of, of all the nonlinearities that are so important in general relativity. And one might, you know, think, hey, um, you know, we should at least capture some of the key features. So how about going to second order in perturbation theory? Can we learn something interesting by doing that? Right, and can we probe these nonlinearities? So yes, you can. And I'm gonna show you very schematically, you know, it's very, very hand wavy here, how such a calculation would go um, and if, the equations don't really make sense. That's also a little bit because I'm being a little bit hand wavy. Um, so uh, bear with me, but I hope you get the key points um, from these next two slides. And then we're back to uh, pictures. Good. So at first order, right? roughly speaking, you can write, or you can write if you want, the perturbations on the black hole, like some operator that depends on just your background quantities, right? So on the mass and the spin of the black hole and things like that on some, some variable that you want to solve for equals zero. This is the equation you have, right? And we know how to solve this. We have all kinds of approximation methods um, that get us the quasi normal modes out when we impose the appropriate boundary conditions or we can solve it numerically. There's no exact analytic solution. But anyhow, this has been very well established. Now, next order in perturbation theory, we get a very similar equation, right? So the left-hand side is uh, the same. Essentially, the operator is identical. 
Uh, but now we're acting on a second order quantity. And the key difference is now that the right hand side isn't zero, but it is there is a source. And that source is determined by um, your first order solution, right? So by your metric perturbations at first order. Now, this equation at second order, right? Like at first order, we cannot even solve it analytically exactly, right? So at second order, also no hope of doing that. Um, but we can solve it numerically. And people are, are sort of working on it. Currently, different groups get slightly different answers. So um, it's not completely settled yet, but, but you know, lots of work in progress, I would say. Um, now, the cool thing is like to solve this exactly, it's very you know, difficult, as I said, right? You need uh, all kinds of codes, but there's something that's quite easy to extract from these signals. And that is how, what kind of frequencies you would have. So for instance, right, if I, as I told you, right, at, at linear order, I can decompose my solution as uh, some damped sinusoids at first order. At second uh, order, if I do that. Beatrice, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. So can you do something with this uh, viewer plan panel that is cropping up at the right hand side? It's actually masking ah. a few figures or a few. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can just get rid of it. it... Ah, that's fine. Is this better? Yeah, it's better. And also probably you can just, uh, uh, the slide, uh, you can make it shorter because uh, one bracket I could not see uh, to the That's right. If you can, ah. uh, uh, but I, otherwise it's fine. I think it's okay. Okay, I don't know how to make it smaller, but uh, this yeah. YLM Only one bracket you're missing. YLM theta phi is the last expression, right? Um, yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks for uh, saying that. Good. So as I said, right, so it's very hard to analyze these ex or this expression at second order uh, exactly. But one thing is easy to grasp, and that is which amplitudes or which are, which frequencies you're getting at. Right? So if I do a free decomposition and, you know, similarly write it as certain in this form, as I would at linear order, you can already see, right, that since the source will be comprised of, you know, uh, first order quantity squared, the frequency at second order will have to be, you know, at second order will have to be something like the difference or the sum of the frequencies at linear order. So this is super nice, right? So without having to do this very difficult calculation, you can already learn that frequency sourced by the source, right, will have to be just sums or differences from the linear of the linear frequencies. And that's great, right? Because the linear frequencies we know for years, right? They have been calculated many times. They're, they're very well known. There are all kinds of tables and things out there. So it's very easy to know what the second order uh, frequencies have to be. Now, of course, if you also want to understand what the amplitudes are at second order, you have to do a lot more work. But roughly speaking, the amplitudes at second order have an interesting feature, right? So if I substitute these, these decompositions into these equations, is there a question or was that just happened to be some background noise? Yeah, yeah, that's some noise. Okay, so roughly speaking, right, if I, on the left hand side, I get, you know, a bunch of operators with my, my second order amplitude, and on the right, I get my, of course, my background quantities, right, that are, you know, part of the source, my amplitudes from the first order part, and of course, also the, the you know, the angular bits, which, you know, I'll get products of, of YLMs, which will give me some Glebs Gordon co coefficients time new YLMs, roughly speaking, right? So what you should get at second order, if you uh, zoom out a bit, is just that the amplitude at second order should be quadratic in the amplitudes at first order, with, you know, only some constant that can only depend on the background quantities, right? All the initial data is in the amplitudes, and all the other stuff should just be background quantity. And background quantities are, you know, the black hole background. So they can only depend on the mass and the spin. 
So in principle, at second order, if we're going to do the full calculation, you should get an amplitude relation like this. Um, and that is something that, that's still being sought after. Uh, good. So this is the theory thing. Now, does this actually, is this actually relevant, right, in real life situations, right, when we analyze gravitational wave data? The question is not yet, but what people did two, almost two years ago, they said, okay, uh, you know, our real gravitational wave data is not sensitive enough to worry about this yet, but we have excellent numerical simulations. And let's try to see if we can find evidence of these nonlinearities in these second order or in these numerical simulations. And two different groups published this at the same time. I'm showing a plot here of one of those groups. Um, in the other paper, you can find more or less an identical plot. Uh, and what are you seeing here? So let me take you through it because it's sort of complicated. I am assuming, by the way, I, sh I should have checked, but you are seeing my mouse, right, if I move? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, good, yes. Good, so what are you seeing here? So on horizontal axis, we have the real part, and on the vertical axis, the imaginary part of a frequency. And what these people did is they looked at an, a numerical simulation, and they extracted a given mode, an L equals four mode. And they fitted that mode with the dominant uh, frequency, right? So the four, four, zero. Excellent, right? They said, great, this fits the data well. Then they asked data, okay, is there, you know, if we were to remove this mode, is there evidence of additional modes present in this signal, right? In this L equals four mode. And the answer was yes. So the mode that they found next was an overtone. So the 441 frequency. And then they asked us, you know, the data once more, okay, if we account for both the fundamental mode and the first overtone, is there an additional frequency present in the data? And they sort of did this agnostically. So they said, right, let's just search whatever frequency the data, or yeah, the data seems to, to prefer. So we'll scan over the whole and just let the data decide where the match between you know, our quasi-normal mode model and the data is best. Right? So in that case, they looked at something that you call the mismatch, which is something you want to be as low as possible. Right? So as low as possible means that you are in this regime. And in that regime, right, you see exactly this frequency, which is a prediction from quadratic order and perturbation theory. And it's not, you know, that you would, which you might not even have expected, that you would have seen the next order in perturbation or the next overtone, right? Which is something that you would get from the linear uh, linear theory, right? Which would be up here. So this was the first evidence that people saw of, hey, you know, we can with just a simple model of three, you know, including three frequencies, which is not that much, we can see evidence of, you know, second order perturbation theory. I think this is incredibly exciting, especially given, you know, uh, a paper that came out just last week that is quite optimistic that we can actually do this, not just with LIGO and Virgo yet, but uh, with the next generation of uh, gravitational wave detectors. So with the Einstein telescope and uh, certainly with LISA. So this is great, right? So currently this is still futuristic, but you know, soon we will actually be able to see these things in real data. Now, why do I sort of as a theorist think this is really exciting? It's because typically, right, if I observe something, right, I get the full signal. So, you know, as a theorist, super easy to split my my calculation in a linear part and a nonlinear part, right? We do that all the time. But you know, observations, right, whatever you see, they don't have this split in them, right? You just get the full shabam, right? You observe the combination, not, not each part separately. But when you look at these frequencies, they're fingerprinted from you know which order in, in perturbation theory they come, right? So if you see a particular frequency, you know, oh, that's a linear mode, or that's you know a mode in, in coming from second order. 
So this is, to me, or this is unique, right? So that you get to split your signal into a linear and a nonlinear part. And I think that's very exciting because it really allows you to do uh, or probe general relativity in a new way, right? And directly sort of um, study its linear bit and its nonlinear bit. <laughs> and there's no other part of the gravitational wave signal that you can do this with. Now, what I showed you so far is all stuff that we do um, right, at infinity, right? far away from the black hole. Right? So our observations are far away from the black hole, uh, also in these numerical simulations. Right? They, they studied the data far away from the black hole. And I was wondering, can we also model the black hole horizon with quasi-normal modes? Um, and sort of the angel part in me said, yeah, sure, right? The horizon should be more nonlinear, right? Strong field regime, you would expect these nonlinearities to be uh, stronger, but you know nothing should be too crazy. So it should actually be easier also to find these quadratic quasi-normal modes. And, or, and whereby I mean like quadratic quasi-normal modes are these, these modes from second order uh, perturbation theory. The devil in me said, okay, wait, the horizon, <laughs> You're saying your horizon is strong field regime. So, you know, it should be hopeless to even try to find any quasi-normal modes, right? You should not even try, right? Because black hole perturbation theory should not be valid in any way. Uh, luckily, I had a very brave student that was willing to go look at numerical simulations and try to extract this at the horizon. So uh, we know the answer and I'll tell you soon. But first you may wonder, wait, why do I even care about the horizon if you know all the observations that we do are at null infinity, right? So if you look at this Penrose diagram, right, all our observations, roughly speaking, are are here. But now I want to look here at the horizon, and my answer to that is, well, actually, this is very similar to electric magnetic observations and their sources. So, for instance, right. If you see light, right, we see light all the time. That's, you know, why we see stuff not so exciting. But, you know, if we have special telescopes, right, we can see light coming from interesting sources and then things become interesting. But even if you have, you know, say a big telescope and you see some gamma rays, that in and of itself is not exciting. Only when you can connect it to a source right, and learn key properties of that source does it become, you know, truly interesting. So, for instance, right, the gamma rays that were associated with the uh, merger of this uh, of these two neutron stars, right, but we saw also saw with gravitational waves, were you know had lots and lots of information, and that was very exciting. But it was only because we could connect, you know, our observation at an at infinity, right, to its source. And, you know, the same will hold for gravitational waves. I mean, I think gravitational waves in those themselves are exciting, right, like just seeing them. But truly, right, they are interesting because of their origin, right? They tell us information about black holes, neutron stars, uh, possibly other objects. So the true, you know, exciting things that will come from gravitational waves, right, is when we can connect the wave to its origin. And, you know, as a corollary to this, right, these quasi-normal modes are exactly interesting because they're emitted by black holes, right? So they tell us stuff about black holes. And that's why I like to look at the horizon. So in this talk, I'm just focusing on studying the horizon and I'm not connecting it yet to things at infinity. That would of course be the next step. But you know, one one step at a time. So let's first focus on learning things about the horizon. Now I want to make a disclaimer. What I'm going to show you here are results that are all based on fitting observations. So what I'm looking at is some numerical simulations, and I go fit them with a, a damped sinusoid signal and trying to understand, you know, how well these fits work. Can we understand? Do they work? Can we describe this with quasi-normal modes, et cetera? Um, 
there's no theoretical derivation yet of, of why and how this should work. But um, okay, that will be the next step, of course. So what are the, the sets of simulations that I'm using? Well, I use two sets of simulations um, that come from the Einstein Tools Kit and that are quite simple, right? So they describe the head-on collision of two black holes, non-rotating black holes. As a result, also the, the, the final black hole is also non-rotating. And the whole simulation is, is axisymmetric. So that means that there are no uh, m equals zero quasi-normal modes in my signal. Now, the cool part is about these simulations is that they are very, very high resolution near the horizon. So I can really do this analysis reliably. Uh, the bad part about these simulations is, is that as a result, they have very poor sim poor resolution near infinity. So, you know, ultimately, right, as I said, it would be very nice to connect the horizon to infinity and, you know, make this, this, this connection sharp. But currently, even the numerical simulations are not good enough to do that both at the same time. So I'm focusing just on the horizon. Now, and I have, as I said, two different sets. So I don't know if this means anything to you, but um, roughly speaking, the two sets can be divided into a class of unboosted simulations, which have, where the two black holes have different masses, but they start initially, so to say, at rest from each other. So there's no, no, they don't have any momentum going towards each other. So we denote that with like P equals zero, the unboosted case. And then we also have a set of simulations where we set the mass is equal, but we give them some equal uh, velocity going towards each other. So this is the case that we call boosted. The, um, if, uh, if you know anything about real Lindquist initial data, like this is the, the case with P non-zero. Now, as you can imagine, right, also from your particle physics, right, like the reason that we have, you know, colliders with the huge particles with extremely high energies at each other, right, that is because if you boost the signal, right, if you have high velocities, typically yours, you know, what you see is it's easier uh, to get an interesting signal. And that's also happens in the boosted case. So it turns out that in the boosted set of simulations, even the linear amplitudes of the quasi-normal modes are 10 times as big. So that means that the quadratic amplitudes compared to the unboosted case, right, are roughly speaking 100 times as big, right, because uh, the quadratic amplitudes are uh, proportional to the linear one squared. So it's much, or it's easier to find quadratic amplitudes in the boosted case than in the unboosted one. Now, what are we looking at, right? So key question, of course. So at infinity, of course, we, or of course, we, we look at the gravitational waveform. Now the equivalent of the, the gravitational waveform, right, is at the horizon would be something that we call uh, the shear. And in particular, right, the shear measures sort of how the horizon deforms. So what you see here is a horizon of a black hole evolving in time, right? Where time, of course, you know, as, often is the case in, in general relativity, goes upwards. So as you see at late time, right, initially when the two black holes merge, the horizon will grow. That's what you see here. But at late times, right, the black hole just becomes, you know, a boring stationary black hole, right, that is um, not changing its mass or uh, and spin anymore. And it will just, you know, become, uh, uh, a standard curve black hole, and and there you right you see that the horizon is no longer changing its area. But this is the interesting phase, right, where the horizon is dynamical and um, it's still deformed, right, and that's where you know you can expect quasi-normal modes to describe the horizon properties, right. So the shear measures that, right. The shear measures the deformations of the horizon, and in particular we we look at the shear of the uh, outward going null normal, which you know I highlighted. Uh, with this L. So that's the equivalent, you know, if this was too, too complicated, just think of the shear as the equivalent of the waveform at infinity. Now there's one key point, and that, you know, is the choice of time, right? A choice of time is directly related to your definition of a frequency. Because remember also, you know, in, in your 
um, decomposition, right? You get like e to the power i omega t, right? So if I change the t, right, naturally you would change the omega. Now, in a numerical simulation, right, it's not obvious um, what time you're getting out, right? We're just using the numerical, or at least that's what we're going to do, right? We're simply going to use the simulation time. But that doesn't mean that the simulation time, right, is the time that you would use or naturally get from black hole perturbation theory, which gives you the predictions for the quasi-normal modes. Right, so this is a little bit of, an, well, an, a leap of faith. Uh, so typically we, in, in other sim or in other situations, people have seen that the simulation time has all kinds of nice properties, but the principle, right, it has nothing to do with say, the background Schwarzschild time, or even if, if one were, occurred, were to be able to, to find that one. So this was a leap of faith, right? We just said, okay, let's go see if this works. But a priori, there's there's no guarantee that 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 would have worked. Note that this actually is the same issue at infinity, right? So even also in the case for the numerical simulations, right, that I showed or the plot that I showed you before, based on the numerical simulations, they have the same issue. But at infinity, you can sort of argue, well, you know, the simulation time uh, and the um, you know the, maybe the more natural time that you would want, say like a Bondi time or, or things like that. Uh, they should all roughly be the same because you're in a weak field regime. So this should not really be an issue. Uh, at the horizon, one cannot make that argument. So this is still like um, something to be understood better. Nonetheless, um, one thing that, you know, is better th or that we have extra control over and, and that you don't have at infinity is sort of when do, can we sort of realistically talk about a ring down phase, right? Because we say, oh, the ring down phase, right? we can describe well with black hole perturbation theory, right? And we say black hole perturbation theory, we say, okay, we have a background black hole, right? With a constant mass and spin and then perturbations on it. So now in, you know, since we have access area of the horizon, we can also see how much that area and thus the mass of that black hole changes. So we say, okay, well, you know, for us, it seems reasonable to say, well, if the mass changes less than 1%, then you can realistically, or, you know, then your black hole perturbation theory should be valid. At infinity, you cannot do that because you don't have a direct axis of this, this mass measurement of your black hole. So what you see here in this plot is, that you know, the simulations start at some time t equals zero. Um, and you see that the area of the common horizon, sorry, the t equals zero is, the, is not when the, the simulation starts, but when a first a common horizon is formed. You see that the area in all cases sort of changes still by a few percent and then drops down quite quickly. And you see sort of like, that the two sets of simulations are quite different. So in the boosted case, the change in, in the mass is still, uh, is much larger than in the unboosted case. Nonetheless, right, uh, we use for all simulations the same criteria, so, or the same same uh, starting point. So you see that, you know, at this time of, you know, 8.2M, all simulations have their mass changing less than 1%. So we'll take for all simulations the same uh, time from like t 8.2 till the end to to uh, as the, the part of the data that we're going to to analyze. Now, when we analyze the data, right? As I said, we had these two different sets of simulations. It turns out that the unboosted model we need a model with four tones, and in the boosted model we have a model with three tones included. So this is a little bit different. But other than that, the whole analysis is, is very, very similar. Now, I can show you, of course, plots for all the different cases that we have. But uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on one representative case. So I'm going to focus on simulation 7, um, which is one of the boosted cases. So we have equal masses. And as a result, um, it means that we only excite the L equals even mode. So we get like L equals two, four, and six, but no L equals 
uh, you know, three, five, etc. And in the labels of the plots, I am changing notation because right, all my simulations are actually symmetric. So all of my M modes or the, the, the integers M will be zero. So I'm, I'm just dropping them off. And so instead of writing LMN, I'll just write LN. Good. So here is, well, now a similar plot to the one you've seen before, but now at the horizon. So what did I do? Um, right, we looked again sort of at the data, at, at the horizon, at the shear and ask, okay, if I have my, my my data, like how well is it fitted by these quasi-normal mode frequencies? So we fixed first or we find first that we need the fundamental mode, the 2001 is dominant, great. Then we look at, is there extra stuff there? The answer is yes. So there's the first overtone that's there. Then we ask still the question, okay, what is the next frequency the data prefers? And here you see again the mismatch, um, and we see that the mismatch is minimized here, right? which is either where you have this mode, which is a quadratic mode sourced by the two zero and two zero mode, or a quadratic mode that is sourced by, you know, the combination of this fundamental overtone or the fundamental mode and the first overtone. In fact, actually, so uh, if you something that, that people also often do in data analysis is they say, okay, um, can we also see how this, this changes in time, so to say? So what do I mean by that, right? So I said, okay, you should, I'm gonna take the data right from 8.2 all the way to the end of my simulation, right? Which is say roughly uh, 25. But of course I can also take a shorter bit of data, right? So I don't start at 8.2, but say I start at 10 and then go fit for the data, or I could start at 11 and then fit the data, et cetera. So if you do that sort of you, and uh, you redo the analysis, you get slightly different answers, right? Because you have um, different amounts of data. And what you see is that, you know, uh, or what you should get out of this plot, right? Is that if I have fixed the fundamental and the first overtone and include an extra mode that, the next mode, if it's an over or like a the next overtone, right? The two two, it generically, right? The mismatch is always larger than either the model with the two zero or the two one cross two zero mode. So th these are both quadratic models. Right? So this is almost always larger, except you know for this little bit where um, this regime where where uh, somehow this overtone does better. So what you see is that this is somewhat of a robust prediction that these quadratic modes do better. So the only thing that from this plot, you might have said, well, clearly it is the two zero cross two zero mode that is better. But you know, from this, this plot, uh, it's not so obvious because it depends a little bit on the time you choose to look at your data. So uh, the, the, the model does not seem to prefer either, or the data does not seem to prefer either either mode yet. Now, another thing that you should do, right, to make sure that um, you really fit useful things is that, right, in the analysis, the assumption is that the amplitudes, right, when you fit the data are constant. So that means, right, that if I were to take the different chunks of data, um, these amplitudes that I get should all be constant. Now, I am comparing here the stability of these amplitudes. So if I look at the fundamental mode in these three different models, so here I have a model with just only prediction from linear theory, the first column. Here I have a model where I have, right, the two modes from the linear theory and that additional quadratic mode, the two zero cross. And here I have a model with, again, also two linear modes and the other quadratic mode. Now the fundamental mode, right, the green one, so to say, in all cases, right, it's pretty much constant, right? It does, it changes less than, than uh, I forgot, like 1%, I believe, when I change the, 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 the window of fitting. But if I look at the purely linear model, you see that the amplitudes of the first overtone and of the second overtone, they vary significantly. 
In fact, right, the second overtone varies by uh, almost, almost three orders of magnitude. So that's clearly not a constant. So that indicates also that this model of, with purely linear modes, right, is not a good model. I did, you know, even though it fits the data well, right, the key assumption that this thing is constant is violated. So this is not a good model. The quadratic mo mo models do significantly better. I mean, they clearly vary as well, right, which, you know, partially can be attributed to, um, you know, either numerical error and or, you know, the fact that this is not a complete model, but there's additional, you know, higher order um, mode mixing and things like that that go on. But these these amplitudes are, are at least more stable than the completely linear model. Another indication that, you know, we really need to go to the next order in perturbation theory to describe uh, uh, these these signals uh, accurately. On top of that, there's one other thing, right, that you can do. And so here we just looked at, um, you know, what the frequencies do, right, and what gives us the best mismatch, etc. Here we made sure that, you know, as a consistency check, the amplitudes are stable, but also, right, we should have, that, as I showed you before, right, from the theory that the Amplitude at second order is related to the amplitude at first order. So we don't know exactly what that coefficient should be yet. But what we can do is, right, if we look at different different simulations with slightly different uh, initial conditions, then if that amplitude right, relation holds, you should find here a constant line. And that's indeed what we do, right? So if we analyze the boosted data, we find that the amplitude at second order, which is what you see on the uh, vertical axis, is indeed sourced uh, by the amplitude at linear order, right? And here, you know, I have two of the same amplitudes as the source, so here is the amplitude squared. And this fits very nicely. And similarly, if we do that for the unboosted case, um, we also get like a pretty good fit. fit. So this is another check to make sure that indeed, right, we didn't just happen to find like a nice frequency, but that that frequency really, you know, uh, is consistent. Not just the frequency is consistent, but also the amplitude with something that you would expect from uh, second order perturbation theory. Now there's one very puzzling thing, and that is that these slopes are different. So in principle, we would have expected that since all our simulations have spin zero, so the spin is the same, and we've also all normalized them to have the same final mass, so m is one, that these slopes should have been the same for both sets of simulations, uh, right? Because they should have, that, that number, right, can only depend in principle on the mass and the spin, and they're the same. But weirdly enough, Right, our slopes are different. So this is still uh, quite puzzling and something we don't understand. There could be, you know, all kinds of issues. It could be, you know, um, systematics, uh, uh, um, numerical error, whatnot. Uh, but and, and in any case, this is something that that is unresolved yet. It might also be related to this issue of, you know, time that I mentioned before, um, or maybe not. Uh, in any case. Uh, this is something for, for future research. Now, I showed you in detail the case for the Elkels 2 mode, right, where we found this nice quadratic mode. But we did the same analysis for the Elkels 4 and the Elkels 6. And the situation is even, like I think, to some extent, nicer there. Um, unfortunately, we could only do those, those uh, analysis for the boosted case. In the unboosted case, the signal was too weak, so we couldn't really, uh, you know, our analysis was inconclusive. But as I said, right, the boosted case is a much stronger signal, it was so easier to analyze. And we found, in fact, that for the Elkels 4, the best model is one where you just have the fundamental mode from linear theory and no overtones from linear theory at all, but two quadratic modes. In fact, these two. 
And similarly for the alcohol sticks. So also best fit model is something where, you know, that has the fundamental mode and then two quadratic modes. And uh, it is only not clear which two. So whether it's like the two zero cross three zero and the two zero cross six zero or the same quadratic mode and the four zero cross four zero one. Um, the data didn't seem to prefer either one. But in either case, right, this really seems to suggest, hey, quadratic modes at the horizon are very important. Now, you may ask yourself the question, okay, how does that relate to things at infinity? Well, as I said, right, we can't really compare think both things at the same time because you know, either our simulations are good at infinity or near the horizon. But interestingly enough, right, if we, there's one set of simulations that, you know, uh, have, or one set of, yeah, simulations where people also looked at the head on collision of black holes near infinity. So it's not exactly the same simulation, but it's a similar setup. And if they also looked at the alcohol's four mode, they found the same quadratic modes. And similarly for the alcohol six, they also found like this this extra quadratic mode that we found uh, near the horizon. So there seems to be indeed the case that, or um, that it's very plausible that, that the same modes at infinity are excited at the horizon. So let me conclude. So we have uh, still some time for questions. Um, I, I hope you take away that quadratic quasi-normal mode, so modes coming from second order perturbation theory fit to shear uh, data at the horizon better than modes uh, with just linear quasi-normal modes, so with overtones. Um, and you saw evidence of that because of the lower mismatch, the more stable amplitudes when we changed the, the fitting window. Uh, this is something I didn't show, but the, there's also, if you look at uh, define some optimal frequency based on the data, then uh, the quadratic modes are closer to that than the, the, the linear ones. And this amplitude relation is satisfied, right, which is an additional very non-trivial check. We've also seen that some of the quadratic modes that we found at horizon are also found at infinity. So this is very nice and reassuring. The only thing that's still very puzzling to us is why the amplitude relation for the boosted and the unboosted simulations is different. So some open questions are, right, exactly that. Why are they different? Um, and so far, all our results are based on fitting observations. So are there better ways to do this? Uh, is there a well-motivated choice of slicing or timing our, uh, when we analyze these numerical simulations? And can we link observations at infinity more directly to high horizon properties? Thank you for listening. Uh, it was really fun to talk to you, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Bunga, for such a wonderful talk. And we have questions there. Uh, Subodip 